wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today, and we do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. We're going to talk a little bit today about uh, one of the topics that we've discovered is very uh, popular, uh, very much an interest when we uh, are on a Bible study program like that, and that's the issue of forgiveness. You know, uh, the, the questions that abound uh, about forgiveness, people... Uh, people have questions about forgiveness all the time. It's greatly misunderstood. It's, it's a topic that people uh, continuously uh, strive to understand. It's a topic that people like to argue about, whether they have it, don't have it, how to get it, and when you don't have it, what it means. But one thing you can be guaranteed about forgiveness is everybody has a yearning to be forgiven. And that makes sense because we sin. And when you sin, that, array, that raises questions in your mind about what does it mean and what do I do about it and how do you deal with it and how do you put it to rest. And if there's anything in, in human nature that drives people towards some kind of a religious quest, it's really the quest for forgiveness. In Romans chapter number 2, uh, well, in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says in verse number 19, and he's describing mankind. You know, the greatest scientific textbook on humanity, on things that go on in the, in the world that we live in, that you may or may not understand, the greatest scientific textbook on those things is the Bible. Somebody said the Bible is uh, the God's owner's manual. The one who created man, created the universe, has revealed to us why he did it, what he did, and how it's constituted. And if you go back to the owner's manual and you read it, you find things about, about the way you work, the way you're constituted, your psychology, your suke, your soul study. Romans 1 verse 8, verse 8 19 Romans 1, 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. Notice there is information inside of every person that God put there. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe him or not. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everybody knows something about the eternal power and Godhead. Everybody has a, a, down in their nature, God made you in such a way where you know there is a God, and you know you're going to face him in judgment. Because that when they knew God, see how he doesn't say, well, maybe they were atheists, maybe they're agnostics. Maybe. He said, you knew him. The problem isn't that you didn't know him. The problem is you did know him. You knew there was a God. You knew you were going to face him. The problem is that because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> the problem is we rejected that revelation, didn't want God. And the result of that was vain, worthless, useless, empty hallucinations, imaginations. Professing ourselves to be wise, we became professors <laughs> uh, of philosophy, of human viewpoint, and we became fools. And the psalmist says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But you notice when he says, God manifest it in them, put it in them so that without excuse. Chapter 2 of Romans, he says in verse 14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, they didn't have the written revelation of God, 
do by nature the things contained in the law, these having the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. You see, there is imprinted in the heart of every person some understanding. There's a God, and you're going to face him in judgment. People say, well, I don't fear death. But the Bible says that death isn't the end. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And what, what, what makes death sting is the after that. And in the heart of every person, God imprinted that not in, your, in, in, in the very nature of the way you were created. That information is there. Now, that understanding is why that when you sin. Now, you can have whatever standard of law you want to have. You can have God's law out of the Word of God. You can have a law of some religious system. You can have your own set of rules and standards. The one thing that set of rules and standards, no matter where it came from, demonstrates to you is you're a sinner. Because no matter how low you put your set of standards, everybody, people say someone is amoral. There's no such thing as being unmoral. You have an ethical framework out of which you think. It may not be mine. It may not be the Bible's. It may not be one that you're raised with. But you've got one. You've adopted somebody's system of standards to think by and judge and evaluate things by. And whosoever it is, what it demonstrates to you is that you fail to live up to it. Now in the Bible, God gives you his standards. And he says what the law does is it proves that you're a sinner. Because you don't live up to his. Well, if you say I can't live up to his, but maybe I live up... I mean, he, only, he gave ten commandments that you can't keep. I mean, how many do you have? <laughs> so I'll only have two, you know. Well, you don't keep them either. You know, you do the George Carlin thing with the Ten Commandments and come down to just one, and then you don't even keep it. So trying to reassess vain imaginations, I'll, 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 re I'll reject God's and I'll set up my own. The problem is, as soon as you set up one, you fail to keep it. So no matter what standard you judge by, you constantly demonstrate to yourself and to others that you are a failure, that you sin, that you fall short of the standard. And consequently, the focus is on your weakness, your failure, your struggles, and hence your guilt and your shame, your embarrassment, and your attempts to do better next time and climb out of the hole. Forgiveness becomes an issue for everyone. Now, the Bible gives you an answer to sin that provides genuine, lasting, full, and permanent forgiveness. Not just a temporary respite of religion, not a probationary kind of forgiveness until I do better and fail again, but a full and a forever forgiveness. Romans chapter 4, verse number 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Understand something. Uh, if you look at over Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Law and grace, works and grace, are mutually exclusive. To him that works is the reward not reckoned of, work, of grace, but of debt. When you work, it's work, and when it's grace, it's grace. Grace is all that God is free to give to you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is a free gift. He pays for it, gives it to you for, uh, for free. Works is something where you do it. It's not grace. Romans 11, verse 6. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, you read that any way you want to read it, it'll always say the same thing. Grace and works are mutually opposite, exclusive 
there don't, you, it's either one or the other. It's not both. So in chapter 4, verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But, now here's the grace way, to him that works not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now by the way, if you don't work, what do you do? What do you do when you quit working? I'm teaching, doing this. And I say, I'm going to quit work. I'm going to quit. And I come over here, and I just sit down. <clears throat> I think I'll, what? Rest. Got that? When you quit working, what do you do? You sit down, take a deep breath, and you rest. Genesis chapter number 2, when God finished six days, he worked. Seventh day, he rested. So in verse number 5, when he says to him that works not, but believeth, a synonym for believing on Jesus is to rest. Where? In his finished work in your behalf. On the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. <laughs> the work's done. I did it all. I paid the price. Here's the gift for you. Now, that doesn't mean the gift is cheap. Romans 6.23 says, the gift of God is eternal life. It's given to you freely, being justified freely by His grace. That doesn't mean it's cheap. It cost God the blood of His own Son. It cost God Himself the most precious possession He had, the relationship that He had with God the Son. It cost Jesus Christ His life. It cost the Holy Spirit that relationship, who through, who through eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God. It cost God all of Himself. But it cost you nothing because you had nothing you could pay. So don't say this is a cheap, you know, people, people talk about cheap, great. You ought, you ought to bite your tongue, go stick your head in the oven and dry it out. Cheap, great. No, grace costs God everything because you didn't have anything to pay for it. Now, religion says, well, you can pay a part. I love that song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Religion says, Jesus paid a part, and I a part you know. Sin had left a crimson stain, we washed it white as snow. No, you didn't, no, you didn't, no, you didn't. Your works are the problem. So Jesus Christ provides it. You trust him. He counts it to you for righteousness. Now, verse 6. Even as David also describes the blessedness, the joy, the excitement of the man whom God imputed to the man to whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, "Blessed are they whose sins are, uh, whose iniquities are forgiven, whose iniquities are sent away to the cross to be fully and completely paid for, sent away to Calvary where Christ took." our sins, and was made sin for us, and put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself. Blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered, blotted out, expunged from the record, blotted out, never to be seen again. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He will remember them no more. That is an exciting passage, isn't it? Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. That's how far he forgave them. That's how far, never to face them, never to meet them again. Come with me, if you will, uh, to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38. There, there are passages in the Old Testament that describe the extent to which God was going to provide forgiveness. Isaiah 38, the one in Psalm 32 that Paul quotes. Here's another one. Psalm 30, uh, Isaiah 32, verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. For thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit. This is Hezekiah. By the way, for peace, I had great bitterness. Nobody ever gets saved. Nobody ever gets forgiveness until they get lost, until you need it. 
Somebody recently wrote me a note and was reminding me of Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And my first thought when I read that verse is, yep, I'm an, I, I got a need. I'm needy. You know the gospel message. Every gospel invitation in the Bible is focused on needy people. Jesus told Israel, he said, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. He said, all you that are, that are weary and heavy laden, come to me. <laughs> you see, you don't come to Christ for salvation until you know you need to. But when you're aware of your sin and it separates you, and you're aware of the guilt and you're aware of your inability, there's a place to hide. There's a place to run to, to have it taken off of you and sent to a place where it's completely, justly, righteously paid for. Not swept under the rug but dealt with completely and honorably and righteously. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I love that. You know what's behind my back? I can't see it. <laughs> it's out of my sight. God looks down at you and he doesn't say, Oh, I see this. He said, I've taken those things and put them out of my sight. If you come over to chapter 44, Isaiah 44, verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Put them out of my sight. Remove them from the record. Blotted them out. Chapter 43, verse number 25. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions from mine own sake, and will not Remember thy sins. Now somebody says, well, Brother Rick, how can God not remember something? How can you, how can you forget something and not remember? Did he just get, you know, see, big, great, old, gray-headed guy up in the, sky, in the sky got dementia? What is that? Well, you see, forgiveness is not forgetting. When he says he won't remember them anymore, the idea is not, is not that, he, that, that he's going to forget them. When he says he'll not remember... Look at that word. That word is not, I'm going to forget. Uh, God doesn't forget. It says, he, I'm going to remember them no more. When he says, I'm not going to remember them anymore, look at how that word is. That means to do something again. Member. That means to make, make, uh, make something a part. You're, if you're a member of something, you're joined to it, you become a part of it. You become attached. If I could say it that way. You become a, attached to it. God says, I'm not going to reattach your sins. I'm not, this term over here is the idea about doing something again. I'm not going to take your sins and reattach them to you. I'm not going to begin to deal with you on the basis of your failure again. It's not that God just can't see something that's there. It's not that He gets Alzheimer's and, you know, I mean, it's impossible to forget something. It would be emotionally devastating to, to, to forget. I mean, think about how... Guilty you would feel if you couldn't, if you fail to remember. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work emotionally. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is God saying, I've taken your sins. I've sent them, I've sent them all to Calvary. And at Calvary, your sins were completely and totally dealt with. All of your sins went there. And all of your sins were completely and totally paid for in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now I'm not going to reattach your sins to you because your sins have gone to the cross. I've sent them there. And that's the only, th only place they're going to be dealt with. Forever. That's why he can say, You'll never meet them again. That's why he can say they're blotted out. If you go over to the book of Micah, we got a song that talks about uh, our sins are being lost forever in the sea of God's forgetfulness, and that's good enough for that. that, that that's uh, that's now there's no sea of God's forgetfulness. God doesn't have a forgetful memory. 
God isn't a forgetter. But when he says this, what he says is in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, he will turn away again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And he'll subdue our iniquities. The only answer for sin is in the cross. You're never going to stop sin in your life. You're not going to stop the evil habit. You'll turn over a new leaf and stop that one and replace it with another one just as bad, if not worse. The cross subdues sin. The wage of sin is death. Jesus Christ died. And it's through his death, he that is dead is free from sin, Romans 6, 7 says. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou shalt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Not the sea of his forgetfulness, but the sea. When you cast something into the depths of the sea, you remember watching the Titanic, the movie? And right at the end of the movie, the old gal who was the, you know, the sort of the flashback memory was the movie was her. She took that big old diamond, took it out on the deck of the, of the ship, and what'd she do with it? Slipped it off into the sea, never to be recovered again. Lost forever in the sea. You see, when he says he cast them into the sea, what he's talking about is they're going to be cast into the depths of the sea. They're going to be lost forever, never to be recovered. They're never going to be, oh, I found it over here. I'm going to stick it back to you. Now somebody says, well, Brother Rick, what about 1 John 1, 9? What about if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't we supposed to keep every, every day? Aren't we supposed to keep short accounts with God? And every time we sin, aren't we supposed to say, oh God, I'm so sorry because you're, my sin separates me from you. And if I, if I have unconfessed sin, I'm going to be separated from God and I won't get my sins forgiven and God's going to go around and he's going to start inflicting me with financial financial loss and physical infirmity and all these things to get my... See, you've been listening to religion, hadn't you? That's not the cross. That's not grace. That's religion. That's not even good Bible. That's just religion. 1 John 1, 9, look at it. First of all, it's written by John. John's apostle of circumcision didn't write the body of Christ, wrote to Israel, so that's the first thing. A little right division will help you there, even if you don't understand the verse. But when he says, if, thou, if, we confess with our, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many times can you be cleansed from all unrighteousness? I'll help you with the answer. One. For it wasn't all. Somebody says, well, you know, I, my wife can spend all my money every time I got some. Yeah, but Romans 4 says that he doesn't give you any more. He said he forgave you all your trespasses, and then he doesn't impute them. He doesn't remember them. He doesn't restock your sin bank. He cleansed you from all. How does he do that? That, 1 John 1, 9, it has nothing to do with Christian people living in life. It has to do with how an Israeli became a member of the believing remnant in Israel. It was a salvation verse for Israel. It never was a... Short accounts, daily acceptance verse for believers anyway. First John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, little children. Here's the children. Here's the, the people in the family in First John 2, 2. My little children, you know that your sins are forgiven you. They already had their sins forgiven. Why? Because they were children. The dude that wasn't a child had to confess his sins to become a child, get itself cleansed from all unrighteousness. Don't, listen, don't let all this. The cross is the only answer for sin. And it is a complete, total payment and answer for sin. And it sets you completely free forever. Fully free and free forever from sin. Somebody says, Brother Rick, you preach that, you just teach people to go out and live in sin. Listen, dude, they're already living in sin, aren't you? People say, you just teach that, people go live in the way they want to live. You're already living the way you want to live, aren't you? God doesn't have to save you so you can do what you're already doing. He sets you free so you don't have to live in sin. So you can live free from sin. And sin becomes just an absolute waste of time, resources, life. 
the guy following the airplane says, you know, we're, we're doing okay. We're losing altitude, speed, and direction, but other than that, we're doing okay. <laughs> well, living in sin is losing altitude, speed, and direction all at the same time, and other than that, you're doing okay. God set you The only way to be free from sin is in it is finished. It's in what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. And when the love and grace of God for you at Calvary, that is completely and totally paid for everything that's wrong with you, and by virtue of His life giving you His life, His righteousness and His life, when that love and grace of God dawns on your soul and your mind comprehends that, you'll see the love of Christ constrain you to thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead, so that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that loved them and gave himself for them. You can trust the cross to do its work if you'll believe it. I hope you will. I invite you to trust him. I invite you to let the grace and love of God be the thing that captivates your heart and your thinking and you'll see it bear fruit for His glory in your life. Till next time, Maranatha.